Hi, I'm Nicole Kupchik and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. Today, I'm really excited. I'm here with Barbara McLean, who I'm just gonna say, okay, so I can remember years ago at NTI being kind of a newer, newish nurse and listening to you talk. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's such a cool thing. Let me tell you guys, it's such a cool thing to be able to have an interview with you. This is amazing. Well, thank you so, so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. It's really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, we've and hello, to be everybody. Yeah, we've gotten to be friends. And yeah. We have a lot of common interests in terms of what we look at and think about, so it's really great to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah, but so I'm going to sing her accolades a little bit. So, well, not sing because you sing, but um, but she's a clinical nurse specialist and works at Grady Healthcare System, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a huge hospital. You guys have over 100 ICU beds, correct? Yes. So she does some pretty cool things at Grady. So one, what we're going to talk about in this session is we are going to chat about cardiac output versus stroke volume and how they're different and maybe how you should look at them a little bit differently. So why should nurses know the difference? Well, I, I appreciate that introduction and, and I think the, the issue really remains that when we're trying to evaluate what's occurring for our patient at the bedside and we're thinking about we're manipulating all those fluids and we're starting vasopressors and the patient is really decompensating, one of the best things we can do is actually look at ventricular efficiency. And at the bedside, the best way that we can do that is with stroke volume. So I think it's always really important to remember that uh, because I was there, as, as Nicole referred uh, many years ago, but even many years before that, I was there really with the first PA catheters being used in critical care. And it's really important for us to separate the measurement of thermal dilution, which is injectate or temperature induced temperature change in the right ventricle, and the calculation of cardiac output, which is performed, was historically performed in the pulmonary artery, looking at temperature change over time. Now we look at many other methodologies, and it doesn't really matter to me what methodologies people use to look at left ventricular ejection. Now that's different. It's different than right ventricular ejection. The measurement is different, the meaning is different. But for us at the bedside, one of the most important issues, I believe, is if we have the opportunity that we're monitoring left ventricular stroke volume, as particularly in relationship to titrating vasopressors and administration of fluids. So how would they practically do that? Okay, so you've got a nurse who's at the bedside, and if PA catheters, for the most part, have fallen out of favor except in cardiology and cardiac surgery. So let's say they've got, I don't know, let's say a septic patient. How would they look at stroke volume? Like, how would they do that? Well, a lot of it is uh, limited to what your system allows you to do. Okay. So you might be using... Uh, a bioimpedance or bio, bioreactance methodology that's actually looking at thoracic stroke volume. You might be using an A-line that uh, with an attachment of a smart transducer will allow you to look at area under the curve of the pulsatile signal. You might be looking at your pulse ox plath and depending on what manufacturer you're using, you have the ability to actually look at perfusion or perfusion index, or you might be looking at the pulsatile flow that actually is again converted as area under the curve into stroke volume. In most sites, most places where I go, I, I do a lot of consulting, I go to a lot of hospitals, um, I, I really feel that there's a, a significant stress on cardiac output when we're looking at one of these okay. methodologies. But remember, when we're actually measuring it as a flow-based measure, we're looking at thoracic volume, we're looking at arterial volumes, we're looking at peripheral pulsatile signals, that when we're looking at that information, what's so incredibly important to us is to appreciate that now cardiac output is calculated. What's being measured is stroke volume. Monitoring stroke volume tells you about ventricular response to volume and vasopressors, et cetera. Love so, okay. yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really critical. And I, in my hospital, one of the things I talk a lot about at the bedside is while you're titrating vasopressors up, you need to look at the limiting responsiveness because as you're titrating, titrating up vasopressors, you may actually be reducing ventricular efficiency and the stroke volume. So having that keen eye on stroke volume 
So my place. Like, oh. Well, no, that that totally makes sense because if you kind of think about cardiac output and the what goes into calcul and it's a calculated number is car cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Mm -hmm. So you're saying get to the root. Let's look at stroke volume itself. Because mm -hmm. so why why do you think cardiac output is kind of an early indicator of changes or no? I think stroke volume. Is stroke an early volume indicator of changes. Yeah. I think stroke volume Truly. is the earliest indicator of changes. Yeah. And you can see uh, again so. Uh, as you're titrating up on vasopressors or as you're giving volume, uh, frequently the cardiac output will stay relatively static, but that's yes. because cardiac output means stroke volume times heart rate. The heart rate goes up, yeah. but the stroke volume is going down, and that's a very deleterious state to find the patient in. Yeah. Sometimes when we're giving volume or we give, an, we give very low dose cyanotrope, what we'll see is the stroke volume will go up and the heart rate will come down. So the cardiac output stays relatively constant because yeah. that's an end product, heart rate times stroke volume. I'm really interested in stroke volume, and I think there are so many ways that, that we can think about it, even if we can't quantify it. It's, yeah. it's great if we can quantify it. That's what our desire would always be. But we can always look at a pleth signal. We can look at our arterial signal. It's very hard to actually uh, even estimate stroke volume by a non-invasive blood pressure unless you're doing area under the curve of the pulsatile signal. But I always, yeah. I always like to remind people if you went in that room, you had a critical patient, he's decompensating, you put his pulse ox on his right finger, then you put it on his left finger, then you put it on his ear, his lip, his nose, his head, you can pretty much assure that you have really poor stroke volume. <laughs> And we've all done that. We right? all we've do all it every day. Done that. Every day, I know. It goes I know. On. Well, actually, so my um, my uh, thesis was on forehead oximetry, and you know, because the sensor is a bit more in cost than a digit. But I'm like, all the digit sensors you waste, you've just paid for your forehead really? uh, sensor. But yeah, so that's, that's I love that you bring that up. So. Well, sometimes I'll walk in the room, and I'll, the patient will have. Uh, pull socks cuff on both hands. They'll have the forehead, on the ears, have one on the ear, hearing. and you still can't get a pull socks. Okay, let's stop wasting our time. Exactly. Your patient yeah, doesn't have blood flow, yes. and 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 a, a great way to correlate that is to to just remind ourselves that the extremities are the first yes. to to actually be yes. constricted and shunted. And I think what is really important to say is that within the confines of the myocardial contraction, which is what ejects the volume of blood. That if you've optimized the volume load and you have a compliant ventricle and you have an appropriate tension of the ventricle, which we call afterload, we would say that the normal stroke volume goes normal, 60 to 100. But you have the capability to increase your ventricular ejection up to about 200 mils per beat. So normal is nice because that's sort of the same as the sinus no. Normal stroke volume 60 yeah. to 100. But your, your, your healthy compensating patient can actually increase that stroke volume up to 200. All right, well, Barbara, I want to thank you for chatting about stroke volume with us today. But bottom line, if you've got both measurements, cardiac output and stroke volume, definitely look at your stroke volume. It gives you, it's an earlier indicator of changes and can really help guide resuscitation and, and therapy in patients. So, any closing remarks? Uh, I think always my closing remark is I, I, I'm very concerned about our professional communication with our colleagues, but the only way to change practice is change practice. I advise every nurse that I ever meet to report what is meaningful yeah. and to appreciate that your physician may not agree that it's meaningful, might not be driven to create change, but the only change is the one that you can create. And I believe that stroke volume in today's world is one of the most important indicators we have of our ventricular efficiency and how well we're responding to resuscitation tools. So I advise you, look at that left heart. All right, do you Thank have a you. song about this one? Stroke volume? Uh, to the left, to the left, to the left. All blood flow always comes from the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. That's love it. it. <laughs> I love it. So anyway. All right. This is Nicole Kopchik, and this is Barbara McLean, and this has been 10-Minute Tidbits. Thank you.